ACEC is excited to announce that registration is now open for its fall conference taking place in Marco Island, Florida this October. That's right, after a year of Zoom and virtual meetings, we're excited to be bringing our fall conference back as an in-person event. And we can't tell you how excited we are to look forward to seeing you there in person for all of the content, networking, and education that the fall conference is known for. Log on to www.acec.org for more information. We can't wait to see you there. Welcome to the Government Affairs Update for Friday, August 27th, 2021. Now, this has not been your usual August. Usually, uh, this month is when both chambers, the House and the Senate, recess back to their districts for a work period, and legislative activity grinds to a halt. Uh, This has been different. Earlier this month, the Senate passed uh, larger margins than expected, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, And then just earlier this week, the House voted on a rule to consider not only the budget reconciliation, but also the infrastructure bill with a tentative agreement uh, to have a vote on infrastructure no later than September 27th, which is very important given the fact the FAST Act expires on the 30th. So we have a lot going on and a lot to talk about related to infrastructure as well as our ongoing efforts on PPP for our credits clause and what's going on with that. So to cover it all, we wanted to bring back uh, our head of advocacy, uh, Steve Hall, to talk about what's been happening in Washington and give everyone an update on what's going on. Steve, thank you so much for taking the time today and, and give us an update on uh, where things stand right now on our hot-button issues. Uh, Jeff, it sure has. Uh, As you indicated at the beginning, uh, it's not your typical August, uh, but there's some important things on the agenda and things that have to get done, uh, including that infrastructure package, because, of course, it includes a uh, reauthorization of the federal government surface transportation programs, which expire at the end of September. So there's urgency on that score to getting it done. And of course, just the economy needs this. Uh, The industry needs this. Uh, These are long-term investments in the economic security of the country. And uh, and so it needs to get done. Absolutely. And we've looked at the numbers, uh, both the ACEC Research Institute on the economic contribution of our industry, but also taking those numbers and uh, extrapolating those out to the infrastructure bill, and we know uh, passage of this bipartisan bill would lead to 82,000 new jobs, $62 billion in new industry wages, and $75 billion to GDP over six years. All good numbers. Now, my understanding is, you know, really, we've talked about, since really the beginning of the Biden administration, the power of the progressives to force action in the House, especially. Um, but this time was different. Uh, this time we actually saw the power of the moderates, uh, understanding that there's a three-vote margin in the House, that Pelosi had to really uh, walk a fine line to get things done. And it was a challenge. Uh, at the end of the day, the Speaker was able to get um, everyone to go on board. Um, they lost no votes on reconciliation, but they were able to open the door, at least, um, the moderates, to uh, have uh, their party, um, their party leadership, uh, go along with having a date certain for infrastructure. So, you know, what's your take on the House process so far? Well, it was a difficult process on the House side. uh, And, you know, Speaker Pelosi had a difficult job in managing her caucus, the progressives that wanted uh, really earlier action and decisive action on on the social side of the president's agenda, which will uh, manifest itself as part of this reconciliation package that um, both the House and the Senate are now going to start working on to, to assemble um, uh, you know, versus the infrastructure, the hard infrastructure package that was cleared uh, by the Senate. And so 
it was going back and forth. And uh, these are these are not uh, easy negotiations for either party. The Republicans have the same challenge uh, when they're in power in terms of the very conservative elements of the party versus the more moderate, pragmatic uh, elements of the party. Uh, and, and in the case of the Democrats in the House, what we really saw was a resurgence of uh, moderate Democrats uh, taking a much more militant stand. These are folks that see the value in the infrastructure package, uh, both in terms of you know the substance of the package and what will it'll accomplish for the nation, um, but also recognizing, hey, this is a, a win for this party. This is a win for the president. I mean, to the president's you know credit, he kicked this off. I mean, he really launched this idea of. Uh, an economic recovery agenda that is grounded in infrastructure and hard infrastructure. And so they, they, they see an opportunity to give him a win. And so uh, right up until, you know, the very last, um, you know, few hours before the vote this week, uh, the speaker, they were going back and forth on how they would do this. And at the end of the day, uh, the moderates didn't get what they really wanted, which was actually a vote this week on infrastructure. But what they got was an important concession from the speaker and a commitment that, you know, as you indicated earlier, uh, there's going to be a date certain uh, on a vote on infrastructure in the House, September 27th. Uh, they're going to they're going to go out for you know what's left of the August um, period here for uh, uh, a research, recess. They come back in mid-September. And, uh, and they're going to have that vote on the infrastructure package. And the timing is critical because those surface transportation programs included in uh, that uh, package, um, they expire at the end of September. And so it's important that uh, to make sure there's no interruptions, there's no lapse in that federal funding, that they get this done and get it sent to the White House and, uh, and signed into law. And, and then, of course, concurrent with that, you know, again, you have this reconciliation agenda where both the House and the Senate are going to be assembling, you know, the social elements of the president's policy and uh, and trying to come up with something. Um, you know, the challenge is really going to go back to the Senate, I think, on that one and finding uh, a, the size of a package and the substance of a package that will get 50 Democrats to vote yes. And uh, plus the uh, plus the um, um, the vice president who gets a vote uh, to get it through, and and of course that's the advantage of using reconciliation. You don't need the supermajority; it's just a simple majority uh, to get it through the Senate. So that's going to be a heavy lift uh, because uh, right now Democrats, uh, particularly in the Senate, are not unified over what the size and the substance of that package should be. That's very true. And it's just interesting to look because everybody's been talking about the Senate for a while, you know, Manchin, Cinema, some of the more moderate Democrats who are in the Senate and really leading the charge on how that bill's going to be coming together and how legislation of, you know, somewhat controversial legislation is coming together. But then to see that translate over to the House is something, uh, really something of interest to watch. And it's going to be interesting to see how that develops, not only on infrastructure, but in a number of other bills uh, that Congress decides to take up before the end of the year. Yeah, I agree. And, and I hope that, you know, moderates on the Republican side of the aisle are taking notice uh, because, you know, if the moderates on both sides of the aisle ever got together, uh, they could truly be a force. And, uh, and quite frankly, we like working with folks that that skew a little towards the middle. I mean, you know, the, the, the business of government is is about compromise and a willingness to, to talk and to work together and to understand you don't always get everything that you want. Um, but if you can come away with a few good things, um, you know, that's a win. And um, and and really, you know, just just the getting this infrastructure package passed, you know, to that point, it reminds us that, you know, it is possible to legislate effectively and to move public policy. You know, when both sides agree, they're not going to get everything they want. It's not going to be the perfect package 
package in their eyes, but it's still going to be a really good package and good for the nation, good for a broad swath of the economy. And, uh, and I think most lawmakers get that, and, and I'm, I'm hoping and, and, and I think fairly confident that we're now on a glide path uh, to actually getting it passed and signed into law. And there's no shortage of work that needs to be done uh, before the end of September, of course, we are very focused on September 30th, which is the expiration of the FAST Act. But Congress also has to deal with drafting in the committee process their own sections of the appropriations packages. They also have to deal with some other policies related to unemployment extensions through um, the CARES Act uh, and COVID relief. They have to deal with uh, uh, the SNAP program, which expires, uh, temporary assistance in needy families. Um, there's a lot to do between uh, when they come back and the end of the month, which also, for anyone listening out there, kind of reinforces the fact that this is a perfect opportunity right now while your members are back home in their districts and states to reinforce the message. We need infrastructure. We need them to pass this bill. And to pass it on time so it gets to the president's desk before the FAST Act expires. So take this opportunity and get that message through uh, to your elected members of Congress while they're still back home, because there's a lot for them to do before uh, really the end of the month when they come back into uh, uh, back from their recess. Yeah, and all of the spending bills for federal agencies uh, have to pass, or Congress has to do a continuing resolution to keep the federal government open. So. Yeah, there's a ton of stuff to do and not a lot of time uh, to get it done. So we're certainly going to be activating our grassroots uh, between now and when they return uh, to really advocate for passage of that legislation. We don't want to leave anything to chance. Uh, You know, we want a strong vote in the House. Infrastructure has traditionally, historically gotten overwhelming uh, uh, numbers of votes uh, from both sides of the aisle. We want this one to be uh, to be the same. Just again to affirm that um, you know it is possible to legislate um, responsibly, and just to reaffirm that uh, you know infrastructure continues to be that that issue that both sides can work together on and really do something important. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely right, and it's something that uh, in our last government affairs update when we talked to former Secretary Slater and former Chairman Schuster, they both mentioned the fact that things work best in infrastructure uh, when it's bipartisan, and historically, uh, it has been a bipartisan policy to move uh, forward, uh, and that's one of those things. There are no Republican or Democrat roads. They're just roads for Americans. Now, Steve, let's uh, change uh, course here real quick and talk about something else that we're really focused in on, the PPP program. My understanding, uh, of course, looking at the Senate bill, a number of amendments that were worthy did not make it into the final product uh, by the nature of the legislative process. Um, we did have an amendment that was uh, supported by with a bipartisan basis in the Senate. However, unfortunately, at the end of the day, it was not included. Could you give us an update on exactly where we stand right now on PPP? Sure. No, we 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 yeah we had a uh, a, a bipartisan amendment that would waive. The credits clause that applies to uh, to PPP loans. I mean, really, the the objective that we've been working on uh, since this problem first materialized, and um, really kind of got uh, that language right up to the uh, the second or, or or one yard line, and uh, had a last minute objection from uh, the uh, small business committee and specifically Senator Rand Paul, who is the ranking member, uh, the senior Republican on the small business committee. Uh, which uh, was frustrating, uh, and uh, in the course of negotiations with with his office, um, uh, time basically expired. Uh, the Senate uh, there was actually a number of amendments pending there towards the end, uh, almost twenty of them that kind of got pushed aside as the Senate drove ahead to uh, to pass the bill. So um, <laughs> there's a lot of good ideas out there that are like ours now looking for a new piece of legislation to attach themselves to. But the, the, the upside for, for ACEC in terms of, you know, our, our efforts to, to, to get this problem fixed is we do have, um, you 
you know, a refined piece of legislation and a great group of 10 bipartisan U.S. senators that are on record uh, supporting this. And so really it's a question of what is the next potential vehicle that is available to us to attach this to? It could be uh, the appropriations bill for the Department of Transportation. The Senate has yet to take that up. It, it hasn't come out of committee yet. And a number of the co-sponsors of that amendment sit on the appropriations committee. So as we speak, uh, our state organizations are doing outreach to uh, their senators who happen to sit on the appropriations committee uh, to um, request meetings and enlist their support for this language. And in fact, with the help of Alex Katrubas and ACC New Hampshire, we had a great meeting uh, yesterday with the staff of Senator Gene Shaheen, a uh, Democrat from New Hampshire, and uh, they seem pretty convinced. They seem like they're ready to pitch in and support. Uh, so it was a great, uh, great discussion, and uh, we want to have more of those uh, so that uh, we can pursue that angle and see if we can get the language attached to to that piece of legislation, I'm I'm convinced and I'm I'm fairly confident if we can get this attached to something that is you know that's moving, that's a must do piece of legislation, such as a spending bill, uh, we're going to get this done. Uh, so it's just getting it attached to uh, to to something. Uh, we are actually looking at that reconciliation bill and exploring whether that's an option. Uh, exploring whether pending um, defense legislation could be that vehicle uh, for this fix. So we've got a number of lawmakers interested, um, you know, including lawmakers in the House. Uh, the House Majority Leader, Steny Hoyer, has taken an interest in this issue uh, due to the work of uh, ACC Maryland. So, um, you know, we're making progress, but we got to get it done. It's, it, you know, this is urgent. Um, there are firms that are being hurt by this now, that their ability to compete for work uh, with DOT clients is, is being affected by the fact that this isn't resolved and they don't have um, an, an overhead rate uh, that they can use to compete with. So, And we're conveying that sense of urgency to Congress. This is something that's got to happen. It's got to happen soon. Without question. I mean, this is something which uh, our members are feeling right now, and uh, they're making hard choices, and it's having a real impact on businesses and uh, their employees across the country. And uh, again, you know, the vast majority of our member firms are those small and mid-sized businesses that uh, took um, uh, PPP loans out with the understanding that um, as long as it was used for the right reasons, they could get a forgiven loan. And now to have that, uh, the be forced to uh, credit that back uh, arbitrarily is just, it's unfair. And again, it's, it's another, another message that we have to convey to our uh, elected officials uh, back home in the district that this needs to be resolved. And uh, we are fully engaged in Washington on this. Our MO organizations, member organizations are also fully engaged. Take this opportunity to talk to your members um, back in their districts to get them uh, to act on this very important issue for our industry. You know, we're looking at August right now, but these bills, appropriations, and all these different pot potential vehicles for fixes, we're looking uh, up until the end of the year. So there, there is time uh, still to get that message across. Yeah, yeah. And, and that time period is probably, you know, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, between now and the end of the year. You know, some of these big bills, it may be, you know, into December uh, before we're able to get them, uh, uh, get them through and get them signed into law. So, you know, uh, something about the Senate and the House, they love a deadline. Uh, they love to be able to push themselves up against the limit from less past pieces of legislation. So yeah. uh, this isn't going to be any different. Uh, but I can you know, say, you know, we're laser focused on infrastructure and the PPP issue. And if we're able to get that done, um, it's going to be a very successful year on the advocacy front for ACEC because it's our two core advocacy priorities. Um, and they're all coming up to the plate right now. So now's the time to be engaged and stay engaged. 
Yeah, no, and, and, and again, you know, if we can get infrastructure done and signed into law in September and, uh, and get this PPP issue fixed, um, it's going to be a good year and, and a good bunch of years coming up for this industry. So that's really what we're focused on right now. Those two core objectives. And we'll keep you up to date every moment uh, that news breaks here at ACEC. We are tracking this, and I, I really encourage everyone to listen, of course, to this podcast, share it, tell your friends about it and your colleagues, and then also to check out our Last Word blog up on acec.org, where we post daily and weekly uh, updates uh, on what's going on with the industry, and especially a lot of the work that Steve's team is doing, as well as uh, Engineering Inc., which, of course, is our quarterly magazine, as well as on social media. So we have a lot of places where you can come and check and see what we're up to. But Steve, thank you very much for taking time out of your very, very busy schedule. Great to be with you, Jeff. Thanks for having me. And uh, we'll look forward to your next update right here on the Government Affairs Update brought to you by ACEC. And this has been the update for Friday, August 27th, 2021. We'll see you next time. Until then, stay safe, everyone. (music) 